Now, Father, I, I thank you with all of my heart. Father, I ask, Lord, as we come to the last Sunday of this 2019 year, Lord, that uh, everything we do would be led by your Holy Spirit, that you would, Lord, allow us to touch the hem of your garment, that the healing would flow from you, from you, Father, through your Son, through your Spirit, Lord, to strengthen us spiritually, physically, Lord, that we may be made whole, we may be made new. Those who are in Christ Jesus are a new creation. Yes, Lord, we thank you. We thank you, Lord. Great is the Lord and worthy to be praised. And Lord, I, I praise you, Father. I ask, Lord, for a, a word that will strengthen my brothers and sisters this morning, this day, whatever time they may be watching this video. You transcend time. So, Father, help us, Lord. Direct our hearts in the way that we should go. Lord, I thank you, Father. I know that every good gift truly comes from you. And so, Lord, as we are here, as we are attentive to you, Lord, 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 you move mightily. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. <coughs> Excuse me. Amen. The message this morning is entitled, Great is the Lord. Great is the Lord. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5 through 7, it says here, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise. This word was given to the children of Israel through Moses when the word of the Ten Commandments were given. God had given the children of Israel instruction on how to handle the written word of God. And so we cannot, as the new church and the New Testament, say, well, that's Old Testament. That's not for us. It is for us today. As we wind down to the end of 2019, and if the Lord is willing, we live another day and we see 2020, um, that we don't want to go another day the way we went from the past, this past year. Now, some of you may have had a great year, and some of you may have not had a great year. But one thing I know for sure is that Jesus Christ was in the midst of it all. Amen? Amen. He has never left you or forsaken you. No trial, no tribulation, no, no victory, no defeat has taken the Lord by surprise. And I'm talking about those things that have happened in your life. You know, sometimes we, we bring on more than what we, uh, what we can chew. We bite off more than we can chew. Sometimes we put ourselves in situation, in dangerous situations. Uh, sometimes we, um, we put ourselves in a good situation. But I, I honestly believe that, that none of this takes God by surprise and that He loves us with such an incredible love that I believe we'll never truly be able to understand. And so as we sit here this morning on um, the last Sunday, December, um, what is it, 29th? December 29th, Sunday, uh, 2019, that, that we would reflect on this year of what the Lord has done, you know, and, and what, is, what is in store? What is for tomorrow? Because here's what I know. You cannot live off of yesterday's victories. And you also cannot live off of yesterday's defeats cannot live off of what happened yesterday period today is a new day tomorrow if god wills there's new 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 battles new things to go through new things to endure and so what you do today will carry you into tomorrow you know your life is what you make of it some people say well you know um this is what god has called me to live in and this is a situation i'm supposed to live in and so i might as well just just receive it. I don't believe that. I believe that your life is what you make of it. You know, and I'm talking in, a, in the spiritual sense. Now, physically, you may not be able to control some of the things, you know, that, that, that have happened. For example, you may, you were born in America or you were born in a third world country. Those are some things you cannot control. But spiritually, your life is what you make of it. 
And, and you know, what's a, what's a beauty about walking with Christ is that when what we make of our spiritual walk with Christ, to a certain degree, mostly, it, it, it affects the physical. For example, if, if you are physically handicapped, but if you have the joy of the Lord, if you have the power of Jesus Christ in you, even though you may be physically handicapped, you may have some of a, a, a defect or whatever they would call you, a warranty, uh, 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 you know, when you buy a, something and it doesn't work right, it's, hey, this is supposed to be brand new. You know, you may have something wrong with you, but, but you know, but God is in you. The power of the Holy Spirit is in you. And no matter what is happening on the outside, it's even greater on the inside. Greater is he that is in us than he who is in the world. And so your life is what you make of it. This message is entitled, Great is the Lord. Because I want to look at what, what God is doing, what God has done. I want to look I, I would like for you to trust the Lord for, for great things. I, I, I know that it's God's will. It is the will of God that, that you have a greater faith in Christ. That you have a, a, a deeper prayer life with Christ. That you, you, you would have a stirring in your heart for Christ. And not only that, for the body of Christ, for the church. Because one, the most important thing Jesus loves, the one thing that Jesus loves is his church. And, and, I, I, and I believe, and this is for everyone in here or for watching this video or online, but if you call yourself a Christian, you're going to be defined by Jesus Christ by the love you have for the church. Because that's what Jesus says. He says, the world will know my disciples by the love they have for one another. So all the sacrifice, all the fellowship, all the serving that you've done, it's, it, it, it's, it's a testimony of, and it's evidence of your relationship with Jesus. Men will fail you, but Jesus will never fail you. And so don't, 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 ever, don't ever neglect the fellowship. That's what the book of Hebrews says. Don't ever neglect the fellowship of the church because it's Christ's body that comes together. And some of you may be physically or spiritually sick and it's because you have lacked that fellowship. You may have confusion, frustration, and it's because you have lacked that Christian fellowship. Now, the enemy's job is to totally weigh on us and to make us see things that are not really there. And that's why in Deuteronomy 6, 5 through 7, the Lord God gave us the written word. Because you see, when we hear something, Devin says, I'll be there Monday at 5. And I could have heard at 4. I could have heard at 7. But you see, God wrote the word, his love letter to us. He wrote it down. So that way we would not have hearsay, but we would have the written word and that we would look and that's what God told Moses to tell the people. He told them to these words, you shall teach them diligently to your children. Verse 7. You shall, you shall have them hanging on your house. When you rise, they shall be there. As Christians, we have pictures with Scripture on there. Amen? You go on your cell phone and your Christian friends on social media will, will share Scripture. It's there to remind us of the goodness of God, of the power of God. You know, and, and not only that, but when you wake up in the morning, Christian, and when you see the power of God in you, it's, it, it has given you joy, it's given you peace. You know, that, that, that is things to hold on to. Those are, because the devil, all he can steal from you is, is your faith. If he steals your faith, you're in big trouble. And so when we read the word of God, it's by faith that we act upon the word of God. Now go to Psalm 145, please. In Psalm 145, verse 1 through 21, I'm going to read. The writer King David says here, I will extol you, my God, O King, and I will bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you, and I will praise your name forever and ever. Now this is the king. This is the king who's saying, he's saying, you, you are great, you are mighty, you are holy. Every day I will bless you. And, and I believe that's what's missing on a part of God's people today. You know, it's easy as for say, praise the Lord, hallelujah, it's easy. But, but it's not easy to live by those words. Because you see, we can always offer lip service to God. 
And that's what the devil would want, for us to just offer lip service to God. But I believe that when David wrote this, he, he, said, he said, I will extol you. I will extol you. And, and, and you know, that, that word is so powerful. It, it, it's, it's to give praise enthusiastic, very in, with so much enthusiasm, with so much joy. You know, so when we say praise God, hallelujah, I believe we should be shouting it. We should be shouting. We should be sharing it. I shared with y'all last week when I was at Walmart and some man came up to me and was talking to me. He had known me from the past and talking about church and stuff. And uh, as soon as he left, this gentleman that was in front of us, he said, are you a pastor? I'm like, yes. He's like, oh man, I love Jesus. I praise Jesus. He started telling me the church he goes to and he just started ex extolling the name of Jesus, lifting up the name of Jesus, not caring who was listening. And that's what's missing in the heart of a Christian today. You know, uh, when, when, we're, when we're, we, we just, when we know what we've been saved by, when we know what we've been delivered from, we, we, we have to be vocal, not just with words, but with action. We need to be present with that. Hey, there is a God in heaven and he's awesome to be praised. I will praise his name forever and ever. Verse three, great is the Lord. Great is the Lord. Now, I don't believe you can say that. Great is the Lord. I can't say it like that. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. And his greatness is unsearchable. It's unthinkable. What, his, what he can do, what he has done, what he is about to do is unsearchable. We, we, the, the ways of God are amazing. But yet I see more and more of God's people desensitized by sin, entertained by sin and led the wrong way. The Lord says, in the twinkle of an eye, I will return. Jesus says, when I return to the earth, how much faith shall I find? It's an amazing thing for the Lord to see faith. He saw a woman who just touched the hem of his garment. And Jesus said, I have never found so much faith in all of Israel. That this woman, all she knew is that if she could just touch the garment of Jesus, that she would be healed. Oh, oh, an old family member of mine who's already passed on he was sick and he was dying from cancer and somebody said just reach out and touch Jesus and he said oh if I could I would do that right now he had been lied to his whole life about who Jesus was real who Jesus really was but you can reach out to Jesus you can call upon the name of Jesus and Jesus does hear and Jesus does listen and guess what Jesus can do something about your situation amen and it's time 2020 it's a it's a you know who would love to have 2020 vision amen and i'm talking about who would love to have 2020 spiritual vision to see clearly with clarity the plan of god the will of god the purpose of god the power of god you want to have 2020 spiritual vision you want to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, that you are convinced that what he said he can do, he can do. He can deliver. He can give you wisdom. No matter how young, how old you are, God can teach an old dog new tricks. Amen. And it's not too late. Some of us says, well, I've lived a whole life. It's too late. No. Are you serious? You're talking to the King of Kings, the Ancient of Days. A day, a thousand years to us is like a day to him. God's not done with you yet. He wants to finish his work in you. Let him move. Let him stir in your heart. Do the things you used to do when you first fell in love with Jesus. Did you hear that? Verse 4 says, One generation shall praise your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. Now just keep that up, please. It's up to you to give to the next generation. One generation shall praise your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. Are you faithful with the next generation? What are you handing them in regards to the way you've lived your life the testimony of Christ, the praises that you have given to Christ, what you have displayed before men, what are you giving to the next generation of Christians? To those little ones. Uh, and I've said it before, the most important thing at Grace Christian Center, and they're all important, but is this school. 
GCC school, K through 12. Because that, and I look at this scripture, and that is what we're all doing, handing to a next generation the word of God, the things of God. Teach a, train a child up in the way they should go, and when they are old, they will not turn away from it. As a church, we have an opportunity to impact our community with a Christian school. Support that. Not just in prayers, but in your finances. Support it. Do what you can do to make the lives better of these young kids that are coming, that are going to come. I, 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 there is something that's coming, that's brewing in the future that's going to help. And I believe it's by, it is by the hand of God that's going to help this school. But this school is key to, for the success of this ministry. I believe that if we were to close this school, this ministry would not survive. Because that is what happened to the last church that was here. And this is something that God wants. And God will have his way. And so I, I pray that you would join with us because that, that there is so much that the enemy has done to try and stop this school, but God will have his way. And I believe that God's people, myself included, we need to get in tune with what God is wanting to do here. So let's hand off to the next generation the word of God, the power of God, the testimony of God. Amen? Amen. Now verse um, 5 says this, I will meditate on the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works. That, that word, meditate, it's a very powerful word because when we think of it, some people think, oh, it sounds like Buddhism or Eastern mysticism, but it's not. It's to think deeply, to focus on one thing. And that is to meditate, that is to fo focus on the glory of God. And the glory of God, it, it, it's not only just what God, His works, but, but it's also His written word. It's also what Jesus did on the cross. It's also what the Lord is about to do in the end times. When we meditate on the Lord, when we meditate on prophecy, when we meditate on, on the... The Bible says, let your mind be on things above, not on things on below and on the earth. The Bible says that heaven and earth are passing away, but those who do the word of God shall live forever. And so meditate on the glorious splendor of His majesty of his wondrous works. Think on these things. Think about this. Have you ever done a, a self-examination of what your mind goes through? You know, because th our mind is so complex. An untold number of, of, of things we think in a 24-hour period. Th when we're at work, when we're driving home, so much our mind processes, so much we recall memory and, or we play out things in our head what are about to happen in a business meeting we're about to go to. You know, our mind is so complex and so incredible. We play out so many things. But if we would just stop all that and just begin to just meditate on the things of God, always, before you go to work, before you go to a meeting, before you have to, have to deal with a difficult situation, but all this, if you would just begin to meditate on the Lord, if you would begin to just meditate on the things of God, when you do have to go to your business meeting, when you do have to deal with people, you're going to handle it in a godly way because you've been in your mind with the king. Look, real quickly, go to Romans chapter 12. And I'm sorry, uh, this is a scripture that I didn't have, but this is the Lord. Verse 2. In Romans chapter 12, and she can pull that up. I want to read that to you. You, you, you got to meditate on the things of God. Meditate on the things of God. You, you have to spend time with God in your mind. What does Romans 12, 2 say here? It says here, let's read it. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is this good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That's out of the New King James Version. Look, look at that. Do not look like the world. Do not act like the world. Do not be the world. What is the world? It consists of greed, lust, desires of the flesh, lying, stealing, competitiveness, corruption, 
The word of God says, don't be like the world. Don't be transformed. Don't be conformed to the world. And guess what? As Christians, we've all failed. And we've all done that at one time or another in our life, have we? Say amen. 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 Say amen real loud. Amen. amen. Yes, we have. <laughs> Brother Robert, I just saw that elbow hit you. And so, uh, <laughs> but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Meditate on the things of God. You go back to Psalm 145. And that's what it says in verse 5. I will meditate on the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works. Spend time with God in your mind. We, you know, turn the TV off. Turn off certain friends. <laughs> Stop listening to some of these people. Stop listening and start listening to God. Verse 6. Men shall speak of the might of your awesome acts. And I will declare your greatness. They shall utter the memory of your great goodness and shall sing of your righteousness. Are you singing to God before men? Are you declaring before men and women the goodness of God of what he's done in your life? Are you testifying? Speak now or forever. Hold your peace. What does that mean? You know, that's what they say when someone's going to get married. You, don't, you better speak now if you don't agree with this union. You know what? God agrees with his union with you. So we need to speak. We need to confess. You know, by our words, we're, we're, we're saved or we're condemned. Be careful what you're saying. Let your yes be yes. Let your no be no. You say you're going to do it, do it. Don't just be a, a hearer of the word, but be a doer of the word. Let the word of God transform you. Let the fellowship of the church transform you. Let the name of Jesus, let the power of the Holy Spirit transform you. You know what? Make a commitment to say, I'm going to be a Jesus freak. I don't care what the Catholic church says. I don't care what the Baptist church says. I don't care what any of these denominations say. I'm not judging them, but I want to know what the word of God says for myself. And I'm going to start spending time with the Lord. Don't even believe what I say. Get, God, get with God by yourself. Show yourself an approved worker of Christ. Know the written word of God. Hallelujah. The Lord is gracious, verse 8 says, and full of compassion. He is slow to anger and great in mercy. Do you know that God is full of compassion? You know, you may have been raised up thinking that God was an angry man in heaven with a hammer ready to hit you in the head. And guess what? He does have a hammer to hit you in the head. <laughs> you can laugh. Go ahead. Some of you have been hitting the head with that hammer. I can see the spiritual dent in some of our heads. Amen. Right? Yeah. You say, what that? Oh, that's from the Lord. Yeah. Man, you got four of them. Yeah, I was hard-headed. Yeah. But he is also a God of, he's a God of wrath and judgment, but he is also a God of grace and mercy. He is. He is slow to anger and great in wrath. So that means... He can get angry. What do you mean, Michael? God can get angry? Oh, yes. But not the anger that men display. There is a righteous anger. You remember when Jesus went into the temple and he saw them making money of the animals that they were going to sacrifice in the temple? And Jesus kicked over the money changers' tables and he led all the animals out of the cages with a cord of whips. He got all that and he was angry. It says he was angry. And he said, it is written, my house shall be a house of prayer. Jesus was angry, but he was a righteous anger. It was a, the anger of God can lead us to repentance. But then there's another anger of God that when he displays a certain anger, it could also lead to judgment, which only God can judge in that degree. But he's slow to anger. He's full of compassion. He's great in mercy. You know what mercy means? And grace is he gives us something we don't deserve. But mercy means he takes something away from us that we do deserve. We deserve hell. We deserve eternal separation from God. We deserve to die in our sins. But in his mercy, he took that from us when we accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior. That's what mercy means. So he is great in giving Jesus to you. That's what this is really saying. He is great. When you go through the hardest things, when you have failed God, when you have failed men, he is willing to give you Jesus, his mercy. 
He is willing to wipe all things, make it all clean and all brand new. Romans 8 even says in verse 1, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But let me tell you something. If you're in Christ Jesus, you're not going to be acting like a fool. Now, you may fail and sin, but you're not going to be living in a habitual lifestyle of sin. There's a major difference between a Christian falling into a sin and a Christian living in a habitual lifestyle of sin. There's a major difference. God pulls us out. We realize, look at King David. He repented and he moved on. It's not that easy though, is it? You do have to live with consequences of the things you've done wrong. Yes, there's forgiveness. And so that ought to be a, all the more a great reminder to us that when we are tempted, that we should remember that there are consequences. Yeah, there will be forgiveness, but there are consequences. The Lord is good to all, verse 9, and His tender mercies are over all His works. I look at the butterfly. You know, I went to Marcus's house recently, and his dad, when he was in Peru, caught these butterflies, and he had them from years and years ago, and they're still in their beautiful, colorful, you know, they're like, they, they, like they're still alive. These butterflies, big butterflies, butterflies that we don't even see over here. But he, he, he caught down when he was living in Peru. And I was just amazed how beautiful. I saw these butterflies with these glorious colors, uniquely designed, every one of them different. And I thought of the Lord Jesus. I thought of the Lord. Amazing. You know, it's just not us. You know, our, and we are his greatest masterpiece creation. That's what he says. But I look at everything. I look at the zebra. I look at the giraffe. You know, I look at all these animals he's created. I look at the universe. I look at the stars. And I look at everything. He has mercy, meaning he, he has, through Christ, he created all of this. Through Jesus Christ, he created all things. We know that. And that is his mercy. Amen? When, 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 when you're down, when, when, you're, when you seem out, look up. You know, look at the beauty Look at the beautiful sky. He created that. Some people say, yeah, you may see a little chemtrail. Okay, that went over somebody's head. I don't know if that's real or not. I don't know. But I know that when we would go flying, you know, me and Ann and I would travel. You know, it would, I remember one time we, we were uh, coming into Houston. And it was just, you know, we're way up there. It's beautiful, sunny. Then I saw the storm clouds and the lightning. And as we came down, it seemed like a whole nother world as we came down to reality, you know, below the clouds, not realizing that just above them clouds, man, it's beautiful. The sun is shining. See, that's God. That's God. And so, you know, look up. Look at the beauty of his works. Rem be re remind yourself. Meditate on him. All your works, verse 10 says, All your works shall praise you, O Lord, and your saints shall bless you. You know, the mountains speak of the glory of God. Amen? The, the rivers, the creeks, the beauty. You know, I've seen pictures of, of state national parks I would love to go visit. You know, Yosemite Park and just the beauty. In Montana, I saw pictures of, of, of just the landscape. You know, that declares the work of God. Amen? Untouched land out there. But it says here, but your saints shall bless you. Here's a question. Saints, have you, when have, you, have you blessed God lately? You know, every night you should examine yourself. Did I bless you today, Lord? Did I bless you today? Because the word says your saints will. Not, not should. They shall bless you. Your saints will bless you. Your people will bless you, God. Have you blessed God? How do you bless God? How do you bless God? If God has created all these works, how do we bless God? We're not saved by our works, but we bless God by what we do also. Amen. The Bible says that we are not saved by our works. We're saved by the work of Christ alone. Faith in Christ alone. We're saved by grace through faith in Christ alone. But we are saved to do good works. And so as God has done great works... And it praises his name. We've been saved, but we are also to do great works to praise his holy name as well. And how do you bless him? How do you praise him? When you give, when you serve, when you go and help people, 
You know, Jesus, that's what Jesus said. What is a greater, well, what is religion? To care for orphan and widows and keep yourself unpolluted from the world. Jesus said that is what true religion is. Not being a Baptist, not being a Catholic. What is true religion? Caring for orphans and widows and keeping yourself unpolluted from the world. No greed, no lie, no, no lust in you. You're pure, you're holy, you're set apart for the good of God so that God could use you. When you want to cut a piece of meat in the kitchen and you go to the drawer, you're not going to grab a butter knife. You're going to grab a steak knife. Amen. Amen. And, and some of you, you know exactly what knife to go to. And you know the same is with God. God knows exactly who to go to in times of need. He, we are his hands, we are his feet, we are his elbows, we are his eyes, we are his ears. We, 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 we're, 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 we're the body of Christ. And when God wants to do a certain work, he knows who to go to because he knows who will get the job done. Have you blessed him lately? Honor him in your tithes, in your offerings, in your serving of your talents, in, in all that you do. Honor the Lord. He blessed you not for you to keep a blessing. He blessed you for you to bless others. Verse 11. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and talk of your power to make known to the sons of men his mighty acts and the glorious majesty of his kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. God will outlast all of humanity. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, we, we wonder what our great-great-great-grandfather looked like. Well, God knows. God created him. God will endure through all generations. He has no beginning. He has no end. He's the first and the last. So our little puny minds can understand like a circle. No beginning, no end. He's always been. Is anything too hard for the Lord? Nothing is too hard for him. The Lord, verse 14, upholds all who fall and raises up all who are bowed down. God will hold you when you have, and you will fail at times in your life, but he will pick you back up. He will raise you so that you can bow down to the King of Kings and give honor and give glory to him. You know, When we become a Christian and you have such a joy in your heart because you know what you've been saved from. You've been saved from the fires of hell. And there's such a peace. There's such a joy, such an excitement. There's such an anticipation to experience this new life with Jesus. And then as you live today as a Christian, as a young Christian, you begin to wonder, why isn't everyone else in the church excited? Why is everyone so sad-faced? Why is everybody late to church? Why is everybody missing this and missing that? Why, why is everybody not, not doing what they should call? Because why? Because, Christian, you become desensitized and entertained by the sins of the world all over again. Not realizing what's really important. Your time on this earth is but short. And so change must come to you today. There must be a transforming of the renewing of your mind. You must make some bold decisions and say, you know what, I can't live the way I used to live because what the preacher just said, that fits my life. And that's not honorable before God. So there has to be some change in your life. You have not because you ask not. Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be open. Your life is what you make of it. You want to keep living ignorantly of God's word, not knowing what the word of God says? When, when, when somebody calls you, when you've, you've walked into a situation, you're at a hospital room and somebody's dying and you want to say something, but you don't know what to say because you haven't been in a prayer room with Jesus and you don't know the, what the word of God says. You know, when the word of God are the promises and blessings of God. They're there to tell you, to spread the good news. And it's also a, a word of warning to warn those who do not know Christ that there is a judgment coming. And so, you know, when, when you don't have yourself prepared as that saint ought to be, and you walk into the, into the front lines of battle in this world today, and you're not ready 
What does that say? God hasn't failed. But we're filled with a society, with a church that's failing. Husbands and wife always arguing, always fighting, always bickering. Kids always gossiping and backstabbing their parents. This should not be, but Jesus said it was going to happen. They were called good, evil, and evil good. We see that today with transgenderism and, and, and sexual morality, not just homosexuality, but, but sexual morality, period. It's flooded. It's flooded our commercials where, where you know, it's flooded. Sexism is flooded. Our, 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 our society, TV, social media, it's front and center today. It's putting it in your face. It's saying, this is the way the world is now, and you must accept it, or you're a bigot, or, you're, or, you're, or you're, there's something wrong with your God. But what does the Word of God say? Jesus says they'll call good evil and evil good. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of many will grow cold. And that's what I see in the church today. Because we are surrounded as Christians by such wickedness, our love for the church has grown cold. And we just don't love like we used to. The body of Christ, we don't love the Lord. We just, we're just not excited to be alive as a Christian. I'm not talking about excited to be alive. I'm talking about uh, excited to be alive because you're a Christian. Hey, I am a Christian. What does it mean? It means I follow Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, I guess because I'm going to be 48 years old, and I guess, you know, I don't know. I, I, some people say, oh, you're still young. I said, I don't feel young. But I tell you what, I start looking more and more to heaven now. You know, I, I think that this, that here in the past several months, I just started looking more and more towards heaven, more than I have ever in my entire life. I'm starting to think about heaven. I'm starting to think about when I see Jesus face to face. I'm starting to think about what will I do when I lay all the works I did as a Christian before his feet to be judged by him. I'm starting to think about these eternal things. You know, it was one of my mentors who I never met, Leonard Ravenhill, said, live in light of eternity. In light of eternity. Do all you do in light of eternity. Meaning, in regards to will it, what will it mean, what you did today, what will it mean in eternity? What will it mean in eternity? The eyes of all look expectantly to you and you give them their food in due season look to the Lord my brother my sister he'll give you all that you need when you need it do you believe him then look to him and know that he will take care of all your needs if you seek him look at this Matthew 6 33. And when you get that, Ms. Blair, you can just put that up on the screen. In Matthew 6, 33, it's the same scripture. But just look at this. Jesus says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. The food you need, the things you need in life, the things you, that God knows you need, not that you desire. Are you in need today? You need air? You need food? You need water? You need Jesus. Because without Jesus, there is no life. Seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. The, the, the kingdom of God, what does that mean? That, that's part of meditation. When, when, when you start to meditate on the kingdom of God, look, look, look at the earth. This is not the kingdom of God. When Jesus stood before Pilate, what did Jesus say? My kingdom is not of this world. But Bethel Church, Hillsong Church, many churches in America like that are trying to bring the kingdom of God on earth today. When Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. And that's why we see so much false teachings in churches today, because they're doing something that Jesus never ordained to be done. 
It's a great movement known as the New Apostolic Reformation, NAR, in America today, that has engulfed the whole world. A lot of false te teaches, te teachings in churches today. People can say, Michael, you should be... Well, look, I, I know what I'm saying, and it is true. What does seeking the kingdom of God mean? It's when you meditate on how to live to honor God. Not, not, not to be living to say, oh, well, you know, I want to see signs, miracles, and wonders. We don't, you know, that, that's not what pleases God. You know, they, they, they told Jesus, show us signs and wonders. And Jesus said, that's all, that's all y'all ever want to do. That's all you ever want to see. There's people in the church today, that's all they ever want to see is signs, miracles, and wonders. They never think about living a life, a holy life, is, that that is the greatest thing before God. Look, look, if you don't seek him, and the kingdom of God, and the righteousness, that's Jesus, then you're not going to experience the things you need in life. Look, go back to Romans 12, 1, please. I'm almost finished. In Romans 12, 1, it says here, Paul is saying, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, meaning by Jesus Christ, that you present your body a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Another translation in the NLT, it will say this. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he's done for you. Let them be a holy and living sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Amen. This is truly the way to worship God. When you offer your body a holy and living sacrifice, not when you try and seek after signs, miracles, and wonders. What is a true way to worship God? At John chapter 4, what did Jesus tell the woman at the water well? That the Father is spirit, and that the Father seeks after those who worship Him in spirit and in truth. When you worship God in spirit, and in truth, that you're offering your body a living sacrifice. You're living a holy life. You're living honorably, honorably before God. That is what God is seeking after today. When you tell no lies, when, you, when you, there's no deceit found in your heart, when you're honorable before God, that is what the Lord is after today. Are you giving that to Him? Have you given that to Him? The Lord is righteous, Psalm 145, 17. The Lord is righteous in all his ways. I'm sorry, verse 16. You open your hand and you satisfy the desire of every living thing. Not just the birds. And he does take care of those birds. Amen? You ever seen a bird cry, I'm hungry? They get fed, even the vultures. <laughs> God takes care of his creation. How much more you, more precious than all of creation, you, his masterpiece, he will take care of you. Matthew 6, 33, what we just read. First seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all things shall be added unto you. Verse 17, Psalm 145, 17. The Lord is righteous in all his ways, gracious in all his works. Amen? Yes, he is. The Lord is near to all who call upon him. To all who call upon him in truth when you're seeking him in truth who, who is the truth that's jesus when you come jesus is the way the truth and the life and when you come to the lord and the, when you come to the father in the name of jesus he's going to touch you he will fulfill the desire of those who fear him he will also hear their cry and save them the lord preserves all who love him but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth shall speak praise of the Lord, and all flesh shall bless his holy name forever and ever. Amen. And last scripture, Revelation 3.10. There was an article <laughs> that I came across a couple days ago on Facebook. And it said um, that Russia has built a, a, a nuclear missile that goes 27 times the speed of sound. 
That's what the article said. There's thousands of posts, and I was reading them all, and I already knew what I was going to say. But I was reading it, and I'm like, I'm like, yeah, and I wrote, but our prayer to Jesus is more powerful than that weapon. Amen. So don't worry about that. Keep your eyes on Jesus, folks. Amen. Amen. You don't worry about what man's doing. You know what the Lord is doing. Revelation 3.10. Because you have kept my command, says Jesus to the church. Because you have kept my command to persevere. You know, hear that word? Persevere. What is that word? Meaning you are active in the faith. You are doing something. You're not just taking space. You're not just sitting on the pew. You're persevering. You're involved in warfare. You're involved in preaching of the gospel through your time, talent, and treasure because you're doing something with your faith. The Lord says, because you have kept my command, and it is a command from God to do something with your salvation. We are saved by his work alone, but we are commanded to do something with our salvation, with what we have freely have been given. You know, you go buy a, 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 a big, beautiful gift for your child. It's, it costs you a lot of money. And you buy it for your child and you give it to your child and your child don't even play with it. It stayed in the box. It never came out. How would you feel? For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. We're talking about eternal things here, guys. We're talking about the salvation of our souls. We're talking about the blood of the righteous lamb. We are commanded, Revelation 3.10, we are commanded, read, let's read that. Because you have kept my command to persevere, I will also keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. This is talking, this is a prophetic scripture. This is talking about the end time when the Antichrist finally has his way. There will be a final Antichrist. My opinion, I believe he, this individual is already alive. I could be wrong. I could be right. That's just my opinion. But this individual will overtake the entire world. Every government, every faith will bow to this final Antichrist. And the word of God says, Jesus says that if I don't cut those days short, no one will survive. But for the sake of the believer, the elect, Jesus says in Matthew 24, I will cut those days short. The word of God teaches us that this Antichrist will only have a seven-year window to rule this earth. And Jesus says, I'll keep you out from that event in the last hour. There are some incredible things happening in this world today. Is 2020 going to be the year where we see the arrival of a final Antichrist? I don't know. But it's very possibly yes. We don't know. But here's the more important question. Is 2020 the year you die and say goodbye to planet Earth and say hello to eternity? Are you ready to meet the Lord? Have you done all that God's called you to do? Were you faithful with your money? Were you faithful with your time? Were you faithful with your talent? Were you faithful with the blood of Jesus Christ? Were you faithful with the church of Jesus Christ? Did you encourage? Just by your showing up at church functions, it's a blessing because it encourages others to do the same thing as well. But when you don't show up and when we don't take part in the body of Christ, it hurts the body of Christ. Think about it. When we, families have Thanksgivings and Christmases and not everybody shows up, people are talking, well, I don't show up, didn't show up today. Why? They, don't, they must not love this family anymore. Right? Who's ever heard that? They don't, so as I don't call me and all that and all that, right? We've heard that. How much more the eternal things in the body of Jesus Christ and the church? Transform your thinking. Meditate on the kingdom of God. You see, that's what keeps you away from the kingdom of God and the things of the church today, the things of the world. Because you work too much. Because you're doing this, because you're doing that. Today, here's what I want you to do. I want you to pull out your checkbook. And I want you to add up everything that you've spent this year. All the money that you've given the churches to missions, add it up. All the money you've paid to, to bills, 
Add it up. All the money you've paid to the convenience store to get your morning coffee and donuts. Add it all up. Add it all up. I, I challenge you. Add it all up. Where your heart is, there your treasure is also. What are you sowing into the kingdom of God? What are you sowing into the world? Everything you do, do in light of eternity. Our God is great. The Lord is great. Great is the Lord. When we stand before him, he's, we, we are Christian. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We are going to give an accounting of everything, time, talent, and treasure. And, and as pastors, they will stand on the sidelines and they will be there because they were responsible to teach the people. And that's what Jesus told Peter in, in John 21. When Peter had denied Jesus Christ, I know I failed God. I know I failed God this year. But Peter, oh my goodness, to deny Jesus Christ. I don't know him. I don't know him. I don't know the man. And what did Jesus do? Jesus embraced him, loved him, and said, Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Amen. Jesus, he reinstated Peter. Jesus brought Peter back into the faith, back into his family. And what did Jesus tell Peter at the end of the book of John? Take care of my sheep. Take care of my sheep. Feed my sheep. You know, that's not just the job of the pastor, but it's the job of all of us in the body of Christ to take care of each other and to feed each other. Now, you can live off of yesterday's victories or yesterday's defeat, but I'm telling you, that's not the way to live. You've got, you've got to, you, you get, today's the day, tomorrow, today's the day of salvation. And you know what? You've got to ask yourself, am I taking care of the sheep? Every pastor is going to be in heaven and they're going to be looking for the people that they served. Did, 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 did so-and-so make it? How did Bill turn out? Hey, Josh, how'd you turn out, man? <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it is. We're going to go before God one by one. And we're going to get, so you're going to find out that some of the things you did were for personal greed, were from your own agenda, or some of the things were out of a pure heart for, and love for Jesus and for his church. And I'm just telling you some biblical truths right here. Don't go into 2020 the way you've been living. Because I know there is always room for improvement in every single one of our lives. Jesus paid way too high a price for us to just, just live. And if that's what you think the cross is all about, well, you know, I'm just making it till I get to heaven. You know what? You may not get to heaven. Because the word of God says that they'll make it by the skin of their teeth. That the road to hell is wide and many shall find it, but that road to heaven is narrow and only a few shall find it. Those are the words of Jesus. That's got to literally scare the hell out of us. It's, you know, the fear of God will draw you to God. And I'm going to tell you right now, I don't want to be in an eternal place of separation from God. Amen. And sometimes we forget that. And that's why we fail sometimes. And we fall into sin and temptation because we forget of an, the eternal place of separation from God, the lake of fire. These are things we must meditate on. He said, you know what? You, you, you count the cost. And that's what Jesus says. Count the cost. A man said to Jesus, I want to follow you, Jesus, but first let me go bury my father. And Jesus says, anyone who puts their hand to the plow and looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. Let the dead bury the dead. What was Jesus saying? Don't worry about your daddy. No, he was saying, you know, if you're going to follow me, you, you need to count the cost. There is a cost to following Jesus. And that's all I'm saying this morning that the Lord is great and he is greatly to be praised and we all must examine ourselves, and that's what the New Testament says examine yourself make sure you're in the faith because we only get one shot at heaven we only get one shot at hell and one of them is going to win and I pray that you see the Lord Jesus face to face for eternity if that happens my job was done and the Lord Jesus, he said, I, 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 I only lost one. That's what Jesus said. I only lost one. Man, Jesus. None of us preachers are like Jesus. We're going to lose more than just one. Jesus, the greatest of all time, and he lost one. Judas. Don't be that one. 
I care for your soul. I care for the people I've done wrong. I, I pray God knows my heart. But you've got to go forward. And you've got to make today count. Because he's dependent on you. God is dependent. He, he is dependent on us. And if we don't do it, then he'll move us out of the way and he'll get on to the next person that he can depend on. He doesn't need us, but he wants us. God does not need us, but he wants us. And your life is what you make of it. You want to live in a physical or a spiritual poverty? That's because you choose. You choose that. You want to live in, in grief? You want to live in sin and despair? That's because you choose that. Choose life today. Choose Jesus Christ. Turn off the TV. Change, this, change some friends. Hey, your best friend, Jesus. That's the one you talk to every day. Amen. 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 You know, the unfailing love of Jesus teaches us to never give up on each other. Amen. You know, I woke up real quickly yesterday out of bed because I was praying in bed yesterday morning, just praying. And Anna was there having her little beauty sleep, you know, just sleeping. And then I jumped up out of bed. She thought something was wrong. I said, I got to write this down before I forget, <laughs> you know, because I knew it was the Lord. But the unfailing love of Jesus teaches us to never give up on each other. Amen. Listen to your heavenly father. He speaks to his children. Amen. And may the tears you cried in 2019 Water the seeds you're planting in 2020. Amen? Great is the Lord. Great is the Lord. Give God praise. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I pray, Lord over my brothers and sisters that are in this sanctuary watching online Lord I pray Lord that they would be blessed that they would receive your grace and mercy Lord bless them strengthen them Lord in their physical and spiritual being Lord, meet their need. Right now, Lord, I know there are some here and online, Lord, that they're making eternal decisions right now. Some may be accepting you as Lord and Savior right now. They are repenting of their sins and they're asking you, Jesus, to forgive them. And your blood that you shed on the cross, Lord, can wash away their sins and adopt them into the family of God. And Lord Jesus, you baptize them with the Holy Spirit. Fresh, new. Lord, there are some here that are your children and they're, they're making decisions right now to stop doing this and to stop doing that and to start doing this and start doing that. Lord, let their yes be yes and their no be no. May they be firm in the decisions they're making. Lord, may they have and create and receive good, godly habits. Renew them, Lord. Refresh them. Lord, may we all forgive as we have been forgiven. Lord, may we all love as you have loved us. And Lord, may we serve as you continue to serve us, Lord. Lord, you stand before the Father. You are our mediator. You continue to plead our case. You stand before the accuser, Satan, and you knock him down where he brings lies about us and gossip about us. But because of your blood, Lord Jesus, we can stand. We can receive your grace and mercy because we repented of our sins and we've asked, Lord, that you would be a lamp upon our feet. Lead us 
in the paths of holiness. And I praise you, Father. I praise you, Father, for this wonderful, wonderful blessing. May you be praised. Yes, Lord, may you be praised.